Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Let's start our worship service with uh, Psalm chapter 25, verses 4 and 5, page 665 in the Pew Bible. Make me know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I wait all day. May the Lord grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. And now let's bow our heads in prayer. First, um, say to the Lord whatever is on your heart, and then we'll join together in prayer as one body. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all together in your house safely this morning, and we look forward to this hour together where we can worship you and, and listen to the word that you have shared so that we can better our lives, so we can follow um, the path that you have set forward for us. And Heavenly Father, we are asking that you be with us um, today and throughout the week so that we can use these lessons that we learn and share your message to others so that we can bring believers um, to understand that uh, bring new believers to understand that Jesus Christ is our uh, salvation and that they can um, learn the the perfect word that you share with us and the goals that you have for our lives. Heavenly Father, we ask that you uh, be with those church members here and around the world who are in need of your loving care and healing and compassion. We have um, so many people um, in our church bulletin who are looking for um, support in those ways from you, Father, and also from the community that you've gathered here. So please be with Ed Jones as he recovers. Please be with Kathy Rothmel as she seeks treatment. Please be with Frost, Floss Del Percy as she continues to recover. Please be with Janet Fitzmaurice. Please be with Christian Rodriguez. And please be with Patty Keller. And we know that you've welcomed home Dave Keller, and we are so grateful to know that he is with you in heaven today. And we ask that you be with those again around the world who, um, who are seeking um, salvation who are in trouble, maybe not of their own making, um, who are just in a bad place where they're living and, and are wondering why, and we ask that you just surround them with your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn this morning, Great is Thy Faithfulness, number eight in the hymnal.
seated. So we have a couple of announcements this morning. The first is that there will be no elders meeting next week. Um, we are going to have Bible study on Wednesday. Since Pastor Matt's here today, I'm hoping that means he feels better. Okay. <laughs> so then plan on Wednesday us having Bible study. And if not, you'll hear from all of us. Um, the Super Bowl is coming up. S-O-U-P-E-R bowl on February 11th. If you could please sign um, the bottom of the form and leave it in the North X as you leave so we can prepare and make sure we know how many will be attending. That would be wonderful. Our flowers today are presented to the glory of God in honor of Alice Longmire for her 96th birthday. Come, yeah. She'll be celebrating that on Thursday, and we, um, we sang to her already yesterday as a, as a family, so she's, I don't know if she's excited to be turning 96, but we are. We're excited for her. Um, and then a couple of names, please, to add to your prayer list. Um, we mentioned them during our, our United prayer, but um, some, some information about them. Ed Jones was admitted um, to the hospital. He had emergency surgery Wednesday night. Um, it did go well, but he'll be in the hospital recovering for a while. If you um, want to reach out to Gloria, I'm sure she'll pass along any messages to Ed. Please continue to pray for Kathy Rothmel, who goes to see her oncologist on um, February 5th. We hope that she has a good meeting and planning for her, her treatment. Please continue to pray for Floss Del Percio. Um, I heard she was back in the hospital this week, so pray for her and John. Please give prayers of healing for Janet Fitzmaurice, who is Elaine Stevenson's daughter. Um, Please pray for a, a friend of Jennifer McBride. Um, her, the friend's grandson is going to be, his name is Christian Rodriguez. He's five years old. He's going to be undergoing a bone marrow transplant on February 5th. Um, his donor is his sister, Sophia, who's one year old. Um, and Christian is going to be in isolation for six months, but the hope is that it'll cure his sickle cell disease. So please pray for the Rodriguez family as they undergo that process. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, Dave Keller went home to be with the Lord. He was an elder here and uh, a member of LSBC for a long time. He was a big Eagles fan, so I'm sure he was disappointed in their, their recent loss, but um, we know that he's celebrating in heaven um, the ultimate win, right? So please pray for Patty Keller as she processes um, this loss of her husband. Those are all the announcements I have this morning. I'm going to ask our ushers if they'd please come forward so we can give unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And just a reminder, after we sing our doxology, to please stay standing so we can sing our next hymn.
doxology together. Father, we thank you for these gifts that have been presented in your name, and we thank those givers. Please guide this church as we use these in accordance to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us now sing, Jesus is all the world to me, number 404 in the hymnal. Our scripture reading this morning, preparing us for Pastor Matt's message, is from Genesis chapter 1, the final verses in chapter 1, 28 through 31. I'm still winning, I think, in the count of verses, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Poor Andrea. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, 
it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. May God grant his blessing upon the reading of his word. And now we will have special music from Lori, who's going to play, play for us, Christ is More Forevermore by City Alight.
Thank you, Lori. I think that's a perfectly fitting song for this morning. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see everyone here. We got rain today instead of snow, so it's a blessed day to be together, <laughs> to be alive. So this morning, we're going to close up the first chapter of Genesis. I promise you this is the only chapter that's going to take as long as it has to get through. We will move further ahead, so Jess, you can look forward to some Sundays having a full chapter to read. Maybe I'll just have you read the full, full genealog- genealogies and everything like that. But let's take a quick recap back on where we've looked at Scripture so far. We haven't gotten far in these four weeks, but three weeks ago or four weeks ago, however we want to do the math, we looked at Genesis 1.1. And we saw that in the, very, in the very beginning of time that there is a three-in-one God, Father, Spirit, Son, who, as one God, all three persons in one, who was and is before the beginning, created everything. And that is the standard by which we will view all of Scripture that we study. Because if we fall apart at the first verse of Scripture, then the other tens of thousands won't matter at all. Next, we studied verses 2 through 25, and we saw that during six days of creation, God took the first three and he created the form of all things. And then in the next three, he filled that form to complete the purpose for which that form was created. Day one, he created light. Day four, sun, moon, and stars to give light. Day two, sky and sea. And day five, birds and fish to fill the sky and sea. Day three, he created the land, and day six, the creatures and us to fill that land. And then last week, we studied verses 26 and 27, and we looked at God's final creation before he would take a rest, which we'll get to next week. He created us, a very special creation, given that we are the only one of all that he created made in his very image and in his likeness. Throughout this first chapter, one thing reigns true, that there are constant repeats of the same words used over and over again. And when we see that in a text, it should draw our attention not just to the fact that it happens over and over again, but that because it is happening over and over again, there is an important reason for that, that is to use to draw us in to understand. They point us to something important. And the two that stand out to me the most, first being God said. Each moment of creation begins with those two words, God said. And everything that followed it happened, why? Because God said. And then at the end of each day, God looked and he said, it was good. But now the language shifts in this passage. It's not simply good, rather it is very good. He doubles down on something that's already been repeated multiple times. Let's read our text again this morning. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to every thing that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he had made and behold it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now, if you haven't gotten to know me well enough yet, here's a fun fact about me. Rarely will you ever see me eating a vegetable. So if I get to the end of this text and I see everything, every green plant is given for food, I will tell you still to this day that humanity has gotten far too creative with the way we eat plants. <laughs> I believe kale to be oppressive. I don't eat a whole 
uh, I don't eat too many vegetables. Uh, I do eat some vegetables here and there. Uh, at one point in my life, I got to the point where I decided it would be better for me to not eat vegetables for everyone else's health because when I did eat vegetables, it would be a shock to their system. I didn't want to cause anybody health issues because they saw me eating a vegetable. That's not what this passage is talking about. This is not talking about our diet. In the New Testament, Peter is told that pork is good, or uh, like I just view it as like a plate of bacon coming down in a dream, and God's like, here, eat the bacon. But here God says, it was very good. I've got one quote for you this morning from John Calvin, just to help us dive, dive in a little bit deeper, prepare our hearts a little bit more. He writes, it is not lawful for us to dispute whether what God has already approved ought to be approved or not. It rather becomes us to acquiesce without controversy. The repetition also denotes how wanton is the foolish contempt of man. Otherwise, it would have been enough to have said for all that God approved, said once for all that God approved of his deeds. But God six times inculcates the same thing that he may restrain, as with so many bridles, our restless audacity. But Moses expresses more than before. He adds moed, that is, very. On each of the days, simple approbation was given. But now, after the workmanship of the world was complete and had received, if I may so speak, the last finishing touch, God pronounces it perfectly good, that we might know there is in the symmetry of God's deeds the highest perfection, to which nothing can be added. So here at the end of Genesis chapter 1, what we see is the completion of the perfect creation. We know today that we do not live in that creation in the same perfection that it was created in, and yet it is still all perfectly made around us regardless. We've distorted it. We've used it for purposes other than what God has created it for, our view has been tainted in many ways because of sin. And yet, as simple as the earth once was, it was perfect as it was the moment its creation was complete, even if all we had to eat was vegetables. So here, there's one thing I want us to take notice of, and then there's two questions I want us to ask ourselves this morning. The first thing is God begins this passage with a command to us. After he's created us, the first thing he goes and he says is to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth. I want to look at those two words separately, fruitful and multiply. I decided to look up the definition for the word fruitful, and one definition I found which I think is helpful for us to understand what it really means to be fruitful is to produce good or helpful results. So it doesn't just say to accomplish things, to get things done, to produce something, but to produce something that is good and helpful. Or a way I would reword it would be to produce in all that God has put before us, in all that God has called us to do, that we would make something of it. If you're familiar with some New Testament parables, there's the parable of the talents where God gives to three different people a certain amount of money, and he says, take care of this money. And two of them go and they increase the wealth that they are given. And one of them decides he would rather bury it and not have the master be mad at him. He didn't lose anything. He didn't go backwards. But yet he also produced nothing out of what God entrusted into his care. God has entrusted all of this, all of this world, into our care. He has given this earth as a place for us to dwell, to live, to care for. And we see that in this text. Subdue the earth, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. He's given all of this into our charge, and he calls us to be fruitful with it to grow it, to produce something good and helpful out of it. He also tells us to multiply. 
I took a science course, one of my gen eds for Bible school that I did not enjoy because I just don't like any general education courses. I'd rather just study what I want to study. And I wasn't a big fan of this science course. The, the textbook was written by the professor that was teaching it, and it felt more like just a list of his opinions than anything backed up with a lot of scientific facts. And sometimes that's the trouble you get into taking a science course at a, at a Bible school is they just want to give you an opinion. And we read the Bible, we trust the Bible, so do, we do assume that is truth, but a little more meat on the bones would be helpful for people to understand. But one thing he noted was there are many people that believe that before the flood, there were maybe as many as 100 billion people on the earth. Now, I don't know how true that is exactly. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be. We, we know how much time has passed since Moses started writing these things, but we don't necessarily know exactly how much time there was between the creation and the flood. We can make guesses all day. But we can look at the genealogies that have been provided us in Scripture and I mean, you had a guy that lived to 969 years old. And we don't know how long he was able to have kids for. And birth control wasn't even kind of a thing back then, so they certainly multiplied. We think the earth is crowded with 8 billion people on it. Imagine 12 times that. And yet, that's exactly what this planet was built to do. God built this earth to sustain life, to grow life. But multiplication isn't simply just through having kids, because we also know in this day and age that not everybody is able to have kids. Not everybody is able to have multiple kids. Especially nowadays, not everybody wants to have kids, so they choose not to. Not everybody enters a relationship, enters a marriage so that they can raise a family and have kids. God has called us to all these different things. So as we look at this in our day and age today, we don't simply multiply by creating new humans, but we multiply by creating new disciples of Jesus Christ. Because what does Jesus say before he ascends to heaven? He looks at his disciples and he says, there, go therefore, or it could also be translated as you go. So you're already going, do this while you're going. Make disciples of all nations or of all people groups. That's the command given on the, as the foundation of the church beginning. Because the next thing that happens is the church begins. We are called to produce good and helpful results in everything that God has given us to take care of and all that he has given us to do. We are also called to multiply, not just through children, but also through children of God. By growing the kingdom of God, by reaching out, seeking the lost, building up disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, and not just building disciples, but building up disciples that make disciples. So that is the command that is given to us. After Adam and Eve are created, God says, produce good and helpful results, produce in all that I've given you, and multiply. But now two questions that I want us to ask ourselves in this text. The next thing, after he has commanded them to rule over all things on this earth, he says, behold, I have given you. He's given all of this to us. Everything that is around us was created first and foremost for the glory and splendor of God, that his glory may be on display in all that is created, but also for us to have, to enjoy, to sustain our lives. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we satisfied? And that's a tough question to ask at times. Everybody here has a different life. We've been down different roads, different paths, had different moments in our lives that have either scared us or filled us with joy or caused us sorrow. But too often, our idea, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, you know, at each moment in creation, God said it was good, and each moment as we go through our lives, we constantly say it could be better. 
God's it was good is in constant competition with that. And everything that we look at, we think of ways that it could be done better. So what does this say about how we view our lives? If we were those first people on the earth and all that we had were animals and plants and nothing else, and yet God walked with us, would we be satisfied? Are we satisfied now? Do we look at our lives and say, God, this is good? Or do we say, I guess this is good enough. I guess this is okay. This will do for now. It's going to get better at some point, right? Can we rest in God making it good? Turn to Exodus 16 with me. We're going to look at the Israelites. Israelites are always a helpful example to look at because it gives us a clear view at the constant back and forth of following God and forgetting God, which we can all admit, honestly, that we have had our moments like the Israelite people. Maybe we haven't put a golden calf up in our living room, but we've done some pretty stupid things. But this story, I'm just going to hit a few verses here, and I'll, I'll call them out before I read them. But this is the story of God's provision of manna and quail for the people who were complaining that they were hungry as they were in the wilderness. Verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Let's go down to verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. Let's jump down to verse 17. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much, and some gathered little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Now, if you read more of this text, which I didn't want to fill our time up with too much of this story, but I can fill it in, they were commanded specifically to only get what they needed for that day, except for on the sixth day, the day prior to the Sabbath, where they would gather twice as much, so that way they would not have to go out and gather on the Sabbath. And if they gathered more than what they needed, what they found out the hard way was what they had would become infested. They would wake up to the food being infested with maggots in the morning, which I don't know if you've ever, I hope nobody here has ever opened up their fridge and found a nice infestation of maggots in there. If you have, I recommend cleaning out your fridge more often. But that's going to wake you up real quick in the morning. God said, take what you need today, and I will give you more tomorrow. And yet, there were some people here that could not trust that God would do this. And God said that he, this, he was using this specifically to test them. But not everybody gathered the exact same amount either. And we can look at this life and we can translate this manna and quail to different lifestyles that different people get to enjoy. Some have more than others. Some have less than others. And yet, God has provided exactly what we need each and every day to continue in the work that he has called us to as faithful followers in him. That doesn't make those tough days any easier, necessarily. The days where maybe one of those bills just has to wait. And there are people out there that maybe we'll get jealous of because they pay them off just fine and don't have to worry about it. But God has called each of us to walk a different path. And each path that each person is on has no less or no more of God's provision 
but is exactly what each and every one of us needs. So as we look at life, even in the midst of struggle or in the midst of rejoicing, in the years of want and the years of plenty, are we satisfied? Is God enough? Is the provision that he has given us enough? And do we trust him to provide tomorrow? Because Jesus also says, why, why worry about tomorrow? Trouble has enough days of its own. Why are you so worried about tomorrow? Worry about today. This is what you can control. You don't, you don't know if there is a tomorrow. I usually say tomorrow is always guaranteed. Either I'll be here or I'll be in glory with him. And either one of them is good with me. I've still got more to do here. But to be with Christ is everything. Do we trust him with tomorrow? Based on what he's given us today. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. In this passage, Paul talks about the cheerful giver. We're not going to talk about giving this morning. Um, we did just approve the budget for 2024 last Sunday. And if you weren't here... It went up um, because A, it's 2024, and B, sorry, I, you're paying me now after no pastor for four years, so whoops, you're, it's your fault. <laughs> but we'll talk, about, we'll talk about giving eventually. But 2 Corinthians 9, 8, Paul writes, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. 21st century translation, God has given you and will give you enough to do exactly what he has called you to do in your life. That doesn't mean you won't struggle. That doesn't mean all the Bible is pointing us to a get-rich-quick scheme. The largest churches in America are the ones that teach you that if you have enough faith, you'll have an abundance of money, homes, cars, vacations, things. And yet what Scripture teaches us is that the all-sufficient Creator has given us all that we need in Himself alone. The second question to ask ourselves in this text because at the end of this text, what does God say? He said he looked at all of creation in its completion and said it was very good. It was perfect. It was exactly as God desired it to be. And if God is perfect, all that he desires is perfect as well. But we live in the world today. Many thousands of years after this moment. And we await going back to this moment. So the next question we need to ask ourselves is, can we trust the God who made all things perfect to fix all things broken? Can we trust him? I will say I both love and hate living in the day and age of social media. You learn far more about people than you probably wanted to in some cases. And I will say even Christians... We are not always hopeful. We are not always trusting. We are not always believing that God is going to fix all that is broken. Sin has changed the story. But there's a promise throughout Scripture that it all comes back to good. But not just to good, to very good. Yet at the same time, we often find ourselves concerned with how things are going. We look at the bad things in the world and we lose sight. We forget that these light and momentary troubles are a fleeting thing, that they will end eventually. Revelation 21, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, 
and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. What is clear here is that Christ will return, and all those things that weigh heavy on our shoulders, that burden us day in and day out, that cause us to worry about tomorrow and lose sight of trusting in God, all of that will be gone. And these 80 years that we may have on this earth, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, will be less than a blink of an eye compared to an eternity of existing perfectly with God. See, at the moment of this creation story ending in Genesis chapter 1, God didn't just put things into place and then let it be. He was active in creation. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. I heard many people singing along with our offertory song in the garden. That's exactly what we're looking forward to. Even if earth reverts just to a garden that we are in, and we don't have the fun technology that we get to enjoy, we don't have the athletic events that we have fun watching, or have less fun watching if you're an Eagles fan. <laughs> if everything just comes to us in the garden with God, that was the exact moment where everything was perfect. Is that enough for us? Can we trust that we're going to return to that moment? Because John writes in Revelation, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. We will walk step in step with God right there with us in his presence. And it will be very Good. Turn with me to Colossians 1. Before we go there, Jesus kind of doubles down on this a little bit. In John 14, he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Do we trust that the Jesus who said this is going to fulfill that promise? Do we trust that he is making a place for us? If we remember, all of this was made for us, and there is a new heaven and a new earth, and on that new earth we will dwell. He is preparing a new place for us that will return us to this moment in Genesis of very good, of perfection, of perfect community with God walking with him. And Jesus said he's putting that together himself for us. He is preparing a place for us. As little and as insignificant we are, as we are, he loves us so much that he would go and put this together for us. Colossians 1, let's go to verse 16. Paul writes, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first, have first place in everything. Here's where it gets good. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Jesus died for our sins to satisfy the wrath of the Father, so that this road we were born going down would have an escape. 
that we could turn off this path toward eternal separation from God and turn toward Jesus Christ, trusting in Him as our Savior who did this work to reconcile all things to Himself so that we can hit that massive rewind button and return to this moment at the end of the first chapter of Genesis, where God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Are we satisfied in what God has given to us? Do we have enough? Do we trust that we have enough to do the work that he has called us to? And can we trust the God who made all things perfect to fix all things broken? We can say that we believe it, We can read it in Scripture time and time again. And if we believe any part of Scripture, then we should believe all of Scripture. But we're humans. We're sinners. We fail. We struggle. Trusting is hard sometimes when we don't see an evidence of that faithfulness to us. And yet, if we look back on our lives, I think we could see a lot of evidence of that faithful to us. Because if we can look back then guess what? We're still here. We still have another day. Can we trust him to fix everything that's broken? Because he said he's going to. These are questions that should weigh on us, not because we should worry about them or stress ourselves out, but it's important to put into perspective that the God who created all things, as we've studied these last four weeks, is also the God that holds all things in place together. And that as crazy as the world gets, as many nightmares as we may experience day to day, and as many good days we may even have here and there, it's not chaos. It's not out of control. He hasn't taken his hands off and he said, go, figure it out. He's still here. He's still present. He's still good. And one day... We will walk with him, and we will look at everything before us, and we will recognize that it was very good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your word. I thank you for this time that we can take to study it, Lord. May this be the bread of life to us. May your word dwell richly within us, Lord. May it continue to produce the hope within us that you are faithful to do all that you have said. Just as in this creation story, Lord, you said and then you did. And you have said that you will bring it all back. Help us to trust that that is true still today. Would you soften our hearts toward the things of this world, Lord? May we take them in stride, recognize them as temporary, not build up hardness within ourselves, Lord, but remain kind and patient. Help us to remain faithful and trusting in your promises, Lord. Help us to not lose sight. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last hymn, number 425, In Times Like These.
Amen. I want to read for you one of the verses from the special music that Lori played today, Christ is mine forevermore. And mine are keys to Zion's city, where beside the king I walk, for there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. If we believe in Jesus today, this is the truth. The scripture repeats over and over again, and if it repeats it, it's important for us to know. May you leave today walking in this hope that Christ is yours forevermore. Have a great week. Hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.